Chapter 21 Tossing Down a Bone I'm delighted you could attend me, Victor. My name is Lucas Miles. Victor Call had not known what to expect aboard the Shiv. Certainly not the stranger he'd met the week before, hosting an impressive spread laid out across a rough-hewn table. Trays of beef, turkey, pheasant, platters of steamed carrots, boiled corn, whipped potatoes and squash an array of sliced apples and four different cheeses, all manner of puddings and pies and bottles of various alcoholic beverages. A glutton's paradise. The steam rose thick and savory over the well-laid table. Any other time it would have been tempting, but Victor had come here to kill Ulysses Booth, not to feast. He decided it would be Booth instead of Dixon on the long return trip from the Columbia Gorge earlier today. Victor had caught up with Dixon's flight and settled into Aces 6, his finger hovering so near Slash's trigger he could have taken him down in a heartbeat. But he resisted. Ace wasn't the one responsible for Victor's anger. Not really. Booth was the one jerking him around, trying in his crude way to play the puppet master. Well, one of his toys was about to turn on him. Victor was sure Ace would follow the stronger leader, whoever it turned out to be. He wouldn't dream of trying to take over from Booth, or from Victor either, were he holding the number one position. Thoughts of Booth's death had warmed Victor against the chill wind cutting across the Cascades as the Deception and the Shiv matched up their altitude and bearings for an air-to-air -air stores transfer. He had strolled the catwalk, stretching around from the forward gallery, watching as autogyros ran the cables across to connect the two airships. A winch and pulley system was quickly set up, and within a quarter of an hour, large cargo containers began ferrying the Deception's accumulated booty into the mammoth hold of the Shiv. The same baskets ferried consumables and supplies on their return trip, including a new engine for one of the brigands and crates of the new hard-to-come-by aerial mines. Victor then accepted an invitation to join the Shiv's master. Before going, he made sure his Nagant 445 was snug down in its holster at the small of his back. Booth wasn't there to meet Victor when he arrived in a harness from across the void, separating the two zeppelins. Too bad, because Victor could have simply pitched his body over the side. Booth's screams as he plummeted to his death would have been music to Victor's ears. But the Pirate Master did not make an appearance inside the cargo hold, or in the dining room either. The only one who showed up was Lucas Miles. Miles invited him with an easy wave. Please, have a seat, Victor. We have much to converse upon, you and I. Miles wasn't playing the role of an accountant today, and he'd exchanged the suit for flying leathers and a red silk shirt. Now he looked every inch the pirate, comfortable with his feet up on the table and juice from a turkey leg dribbling over his fingers. He rocked forward, swinging his feet down and wiping off one hand on his trousers. That hand stayed hidden under the table as Victor sat down. So, you're not the bookkeep, Victor said. Hardly. Victor detected the touch of a Boston accent in Miles' voice, as though that would elevate Miles above something so lowly as an accountant. Above Victor or Ulysses Booth as well. I think you have an idea who I am, Victor, Miles continued. You demonstrate some intelligence at our last encounter. Please do not disappoint me now. Victor glanced at the table. It was set with neither plates nor flatware, just communal platters of food and two mugs. He poured himself a slug of bourbon, then tore a warm hunk of meat off a roast. He did it to buy himself time to gather his wits to deal with this new threat. You hold the black hats together, he said. Booth is your man, not the other way around. And you weren't there for inventory that day. I was conducting a survey, certainly, 
But the cargo? No, Victor. I was more interested in you. Victor washed down the juicy meat with a swallow of good Appalachia bourbon. Why? he asked. Miles smiled without humor, a grin that did not include his near black eyes or lighten his severe voice. Because you intrigue me, just as Ace Dixon interests Booth. Ace pictures himself the refined pirate, bold and dashing and even mannerly, whereas Booth is a savage. You are correct in your estimation of him. What might seem like a friendship betwixt that pair is actually a perverse attraction that fascinates and disgusts them both. The large words took a moment for Victor to wade through, which he figured was Miles's way of trying to keep him off guard. He was sure the man could talk straight, but simply didn't want to. Or maybe he was just showing off. So, I interest you? Victor sampled more from the table. He found this crude method of eating delightfully decadent. Fascinate and disgust, eh? Frankly, you worry me, Miles said. You're too much a mixture of the other two. You demonstrated your cunning and savagery even before signing on with Booth. That has to be one of the reasons he dislikes you. One animal raising the hackles of another. You've also shown remarkable control. For instance... You didn't kill Ace Dixon when you had the chance over the Cascades. Miles continued to gaze at Victor with those strange, dark eyes, even as he kept eating. One-handed, Victor noted. The other hand remained out of sight, under the table. Victor kept his own paws in view, even though that would make it harder to grab for the Nagant. You ordered the recall, he said. Miles tossed his drumstick back onto the platter. That's right. I wanted to see what you would do. If you'd shot down Ace, well, flyers and planes can be replaced. But I think you decided to kill Booth and take over when you came here. That makes you a dangerous man, Victor. I'm not inclined to keep dangerous men too close. Unless... Victor was starting to wonder if he'd lived through this night. But there had to be an unless in there. He did not believe Lucas Miles was in the habit of explaining himself to someone he considered a threat. Miles continued to hold Victor with his black eyes, but he didn't reply. He waited, testing Victor's patience. Slowly, carefully, and very obviously, Victor reached behind to the small of his back to draw the Nagant. Without taking his eyes off Miles, he brought the gun around and set it on the table between them. Miles also lifted his hidden hand, his fingers miming the pistol of a gun. Bang, he said, then reached for his drumstick and continued eating. You can learn, Victor. You proved that at Sacred Trust. That's the reason I had you placed in their hierarchy. You survived, flourished even, so just maybe you can prove yourself useful to me. It was only then that Victor suddenly realized how tense he was. His muscles trembled with pent-up energy. He knocked back another shot of bourbon and came within a hair's breadth of going for his nagant and plugging Lucas Miles. Instead, he reached for the bottle and poured both himself and Miles two healthy shots. How can you be so certain you can trust me? For the same reason you didn't reach for the nagant a few moments ago. Let's call it enlightened self-interest. So long as you have something more to learn, I'm safe. All right, Victor said. I know you have some kind of working arrangement with Sacred Trust, and that's your business, not mine. But the raid at the Gorge, that was a good ambush we set up, and you nixed it. A touch of his earlier anger returned. Why not let us splash those peacemakers? You could have found other ways to set me after Ace. Lucas Miles listened carefully, then nodded. True, but it was convenient. Also, I didn't want the Black Hats fresh on the mind of Blake Aviation. The same day I recalled the raid, another pirate band hit Boeing Field and made off with a sensitive project. It was an old friend, in fact. He smiled, and this time his eyes did too. 
but it was disturbing, not a smile to warm the heart. Boeing has since called in Paladin Blake himself, who will arrive post-haste to deal with the upstart pirates. I can use that to further my goals, while the Black Hats concentrate in another area. Such as? Clearing up any final business and pulling out of Pacifica. For instance... Miles sopped up some gravy with a hunk of bread. What if I informed you that Bo D. Bryant did not stage his raid against the flatbed train as you ordered? Booth reconned the area and found Bryant's wingman splashed over a hillside. Bodie has disappeared. Victor suddenly lost his appetite. But Blue volunteered for that mission. Pause. Okay. So we plan to run from the start. But that doesn't make sense. It's the act of someone who's afraid. And he had nothing to fear. Alas, you are doing so well. Better to ask yourself, Victor, why he was afraid. The same question that led me to ask when he volunteered. Sunday. The day after the Airshow Massacre. The day... The day Victor had splattered the traitor... Shannon Blaylock, and investigated enough to learn that his real name was Beale. They were in it together, then. Brothers, Miles told him. I hear Shannon also had a dame, and she since dropped from sight. I talked with a few of the people you had shadowing Trevor Gerard as well. Gerard has been looking for a Shannon and a Bodie Beale. Not your everyday first name. It didn't take much to figure out that Bodie Bryant was the same man. After the fact, unfortunately. Bodie must be laying low right now, Victor reasoned. But he'll try to hook up with Gerard. We obviously can't have that. He rose, carefully picked up his gun and returned it to his holster. Gerard will be easy, he said. I'll take care of this at once, personally. The blood scent was in the air again, tempting the jackal. Besides, if Booth learned of even half of this, he would be gunning for Victor's head, and Victor wasn't so sure Miles would try to protect him. You should pass this assignment to Ace, Miles said, surprising Victor. As it stands now, Booth will assign blame to you, and might have you thrown overboard. If you attempt to handle this personally and fail, then I'd be forced to have you killed. That made sense to Victor. If Ace succeeds, it covers me. If he wins through but gets killed in the attempt, I'm still fine. In fact, I'd much prefer it. And if Ace fails completely, Booth needs me. Victor smiled. Enlightened self-interest? Isn't that what you called it? Maybe I do have things to learn from you. Miles ignored the compliment. Also, Gerard's death may not serve our interests so well especially if Bodhi does try to contact him. So the question becomes, have we any leverage against Trevor Gerard? Leverage? Oh, yes. Victor broke off a hunk of bread and smiled. He has a girl. Chapter 22 The Albatross The dockside Albatross Tavern and Hostel smelled of whiskey, cigarettes, and lye soap. The afternoon breeze coming through the door added the odors of the Seattle waterfront to the mix. The saltwater tang of Puget Sound spilled fuel oil, creosote timbers, and rotting fish. The electric lights weren't on yet, not with noon barely past, and the long array of what had once been passenger windows letting in the daylight. The light faded to a smoky dimness deeper in toward the bar, which stretched along the far wall. It was manned by two large and watchful tenders. Trevor had commandeered a rickety table close to the bar, away from the brighter light. He toasted the tavern, tossing off his second and last shot of Canadian whiskey, and enjoying the smoky taste as it burned down his throat. He knew that the Albatross was built on the remnants of a Golden Eagle passenger airship from Australia that had crashed on this site after a pirate attack. 
the Zeppelin had barely made it to the Seattle waterfront before collapsing dockside. That was in 36. Richard Smith, a former dockhand who'd parlayed his experience into a successful salvage company, arranged to purchase the ruined airship, cargo stores and all, as well as the small piece of property where the gondola rested. He stripped away the gas bag frame, the envelope, and the engines, then threw a strengthened roof over the gondola and had a ready-made tavern and hostel that he named the Albatross. As a foreign passenger ship, the Zeppelin had been permitted to carry alcoholic beverages, provided none were served inside Pacifica's borders. Its stock had included French and Hollywood wines, Russian vodka, and 500 barrels of Canadian whiskey purchased just before entering Pacifica. That plus an extensive selection of Australian spirits. Golden Eagle was a popular passenger line, often making weekend runs out of Pacifica airspace. Longshoremen and airship crewmen were the primary customers these days, responsible for the nightly brawls that smashed the well-patched furniture. By day, however, any local could safely stop in for a quick pair of bracers. For the people of a dry nation, Pacifica's populace had discovered plenty of loopholes to allow liquor to be served. Someone set two filled shot glasses of whiskey on Trevor's table. Had mine, he said, gesturing to the two empty glasses in front of him. Yeah, well, I haven't. Betty Charles slipped into the seat next to him, unzipping her flight jacket for comfort. She glanced at him with uncertain blue eyes. Hello, Trevor. Good to see you. He just stared at her, too surprised to answer. What's an aviation security agent like you doing in a place like this? She asked. Hiding, he said truthfully, though she'd obviously been trying to make a joke. Betty ran a finger around the edge of one of the full-shot glasses, then tasted the drop she'd picked up. From me? From everybody. The police, the STI detectives, wanting to question him again about the murder of Shannon Beale, or Blaylock, as Sacred Trust called him. Graves checking up to see if he was all right and to say that Amanda was calling. Amanda ringing the office, his landlords, and any regular hangout where she thought he might try to seek refuge. So far, he'd avoided today's remarkable deluge of calls. How'd you find me? I looked for you at today's air show first, she said. When I didn't find you, well, one flyer can usually locate another, and you haven't exactly been running a low profile. You went to Goliath's Cantina. Betty sipped daintily at her whiskey, obviously trying not to grimace. I did, she said, her voice breaking on the whiskey burn. I found out they threw you out a few hours ago. Don't take this wrong, but have you even wondered why you're not dead? Trevor shrugged. I suppose an aviation security agent, even a former one, drinking and being obnoxious doesn't fly too well in that joint. Well, no one gets thrown out of a joint like Elias, Betty said. Carried out, maybe, but nobody cares enough to do more than that. I'd say someone was watching your back in there. Trevor shrugged, pointing at her drink. It works better if you just toss it down quickly. She did, then coughed hard. Wine is easier, she muttered then glanced around the albatross. Through the windows, large trucks could be seen lumbering back and forth along the waterfront. This place seems pretty obvious. Doesn't it ever get raided? Trevor nearly laughed, amused that a pirate would comment on the legalities. You know the rules, Betty. You can drink it. You just can't make it or ship it. The albatross doesn't have one drop that wasn't part of the original manifest when the place was a passenger zep, and they give it away. Technically speaking, anyway. The cover charge you pay at the door includes the two-shot set. It must be easy to smuggle in more with all the airship traffic and freighters coming in so close by. Trevor threw a sidelong glance over Betty's shoulder. Beyond her, a couple of men were also stealing glances in their direction. Trevor remembered them taking their table not long after he had sat down. He kept talking to keep from giving away that he had noticed them. Unlike the way uptown restaurants are treated, Smith's inventory is watched very carefully by Pacifica liquor control agents. The two-drink set guarantees the albatross some life, but eventually the place will run dry. An uncomfortable silence stretched out between them. 
they'd run out of polite chit-chat. Finally, Betty said, I'm sorry you lost your position with Blake Aviation. That because of me? Us? She covered his hand with one of her own. His skin burned at her touch. Not directly, Trevor said. The reason I'm suspended is my own damn fault. They made me the company's sacrificial lamb. But I kind of volunteered for the position. It covers us with Boeing until... Until? Can't say, he said with a shrug. He wanted to warn Betty that Paladin and Blake was on his way to Pacifica and get her to clear out before she got hurt. But some remnant of pride wouldn't let him step quite so far over the line. She flushed and removed her hand. I see, she said, obviously disappointed that he wasn't going to open up. Trevor looked at her sharply. Do you? You wouldn't care to tell me why the fortune hunters are still in Pacifica, would you? Betty shook her head. So, we still need to be careful what we tell each other. She raised an eyebrow. Or what we tell anyone else about each other. There's at least one thing I can say, though. Nothing we've got planned will affect Blake Aviation, if that's any help. Trevor smiled sadly. And what if Zachary does decide to hit us again? You gonna tell him no? Betty tossed down her second shot, this time without suffering a coughing fit. Look, Trevor, I'm just trying to help. You're in trouble. Yeah? Tell me something else I don't know. No, that ain't... isn't what I mean. Someone is keeping tabs on you. Goliath was paid to toss you out on your ear. Others were probably paid off not to hurt you. She leaned forward, concerned in her eyes. Like I said, someone is watching your back. Don't ask me, Trevor said. The only people with influence in Goliaths are the biggest and strongest pirates. If it's not the fortune hunters... Then it hit him. The Black Hats. Oh hell, I tipped them off to Shannon, and now they want me to lead them to Blue. Only this morning, someone had struck up a conversation with him at Goliath's, acting like he was interested in the reward for finding Bodie and Michelle. A tall guy with long blonde hair tied back with a leather thong. Betty looked confused. Blue? Trevor smiled for the first time, realizing how much she didn't know. He hit the highlights of his run-ins against the Black Hats, including his suspicions about the brothers Beale and the morning's brush with a guy who had sounded interested in the reward. If they're sticking close to me, Bodie will stay low. Or finds another way to contact you, Betty said. I dug up something else this morning. I wasn't sure about payoffs keeping you safe at Goliath, only about the one that got you thrown out. But there was money being offered for information about your past. People you dealt with, friends, and family. Trevor grabbed her shoulder. And you didn't think that might be important? She pulled away, pitching her voice into a low hiss. I didn't know why someone would want that kind of information. The Black Hats... She shivered. Trevor, is there anyone you know who might work as a possible go-between with Bodhi? The first person who came to mind was Graves. But Shannon had been leery about any involvement with Blake Aviation. Thinking about it now, he had thought how strange that was. Why wouldn't Stilt trust BAS? And if it wasn't Graves... Thinking of the only other important person in his life sent a chill through his whole body. Amanda! He'd been avoiding her calls all day, but this didn't involve her! Trevor's mouth ran dry with fear. Bodhi wouldn't need to spread money around to find out about me. It has to be the hats! Betty stood. Let's go! Wait! Trevor got up and hurried to the pay telephone on the wall at one end of the bar. He dropped a nickel into the slot and dialed Amanda's number. Waiting for the rotary dial to reset between each digit cost him moments of agony. Then he felt another shiver of fear as the operator informed him the number was not currently in service. He glanced back at Betty and shook his head. He hung up, fished a nickel from the coin return, and fed it back into the slot. This time, a voice answered immediately. Blake Aviation Security. Marge, this is Trevor. Is William, Mr. Graves, I have Mr. Gerard. Trevor squeezed his eyes shut as though that could stop his spiraling thoughts. He told himself to calm down, not to borrow trouble. Trevor, Graves suddenly shouted into Trevor's ear. Where are you? The waterfront, William. What's going on? You're not at Mont Lake? What we're hearing over the radio? Trevor felt his heart sink. Mont Lake was Amanda's neighborhood. I can't get through to Amanda. William, I think... Trevor, Graves cut in. The Seattle police took the call 15 minutes ago. 
Something about black autogyros strafing homes on boy air. No addresses. Two, maybe three, bird dogs are down. Bird dogs were the armed autogyros favored by the Seattle police. We just heard that a Liberté autogyro did make it away from one house. Trevor was sure it had to be Amanda's. Let her be safe. Please let her be safe, Trevor murmured, not even realizing he was speaking aloud. But Graves had little comfort to offer him. The police say it's heading into downtown Seattle, Trevor, and they're going to bring it down.